shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxon, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, welcome back in Richards. Carter Wilcoxon here with my fantastic uh, co-host, Mr. Chemical Free Body, Tim James, coming from you on the road myself. Actually, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia this week. And Tim, I believe you're on the road as well. How are you, bud? Hey, doing good. Just uh, back up here in Idaho, Bonners Ferry, close to the Canadian border, um, helping my assistant and girlfriend um, get... uh, I'll settled in. So my, just to be clear, my assistant and her husband moved up here and my girlfriend moved up here with them. She's staying in there in there. See, they got a brand new trailer just, just in case because they um, were worried about, you know, what's going on in, in the cities now. And in Portland, it's, I mean, it's just so bad. I mean, the, the, there's literally urine and feces in the streets and needles and masks and, and homelessness is all over the place. There's tent cities. So, um, it looks like, you know, we might be heading towards some type of um, collapse in these some of these cities. So they wanted to get out. So they bought this camper. But then they found this place up in Idaho and they jumped on it. Now they got 10 acres. I just showed you guys. the. I mean, it's there's a big mountain here. It's beautiful up here. So I grew up on a farm and I just decided to come up and help them get settled in a little bit before winter hits, uh, which is pretty much here. It's coming. They already had their first snow. So just uh doing that and enjoying life, man. And so that's where I'm at. Nice. Awesome. Well, Hey, and Richards, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super excited and stoked about our guest today. Uh, Gary Korlev, who is a CFA. He is the, uh, owner and founder of sovereign global, uh, sovereign wealth management. Uh, we can see the, uh, on the background right there. If you guys are watching, you can be able to see, uh, his, his logo and everything, super cool logo. But I'm really uh, intrigued whenever I was doing the interview with Gary, where he came from and how he got to the United States. I said to him whenever we were talking before, I said, man, I can't wait to hear some of the stories uh, that you have for our enrichers because um, of of how you got to the United States. So Gary Korolev, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, uh, thank you, Carter and Tim. It's uh, great to meet you uh, as well. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking about uh, my history and founding this company and um, our plans going forward. Cool. That's awesome. And I know that you are still in the the formation of starting your own RIA. And I think maybe in the second segment, we'll get more in in depth in there and everything. But, um, you know, Gary, let's just jump into it. And, you know, when we were talking, come to find out you come from uh, from Russia in communist Russia at the time as a as a child, if memory serves right. So, you know, let's go back on what that was like transitioning as a child and how you dealt with that, because I, I we can't even imagine, you know, born and raised here in the United States of America. And, you know, the, the freedom that we you know enjoy, maybe not as much as we would like currently right now, but. I digress. Uh, you know, let's go back and then and then eventually how that led you into the financial services business. So so talk a little bit about how you came to the States. Sure. So my father was in prison in uh, Russia when well, in the Soviet Union at that point, because he uh, had a business. He would import things and uh, like jeans and uh, things that people wanted from the West because it the socialist or communist type of a government obviously is not really worried as much about um, the comfort of their citizens. It's more about the greatness of the communal whole, so to speak. So people obviously wanted nice things uh, and you could really only get them um, largely from the Western world. And so in a communist country, country, obviously you can't, Uh, have your own business, even if it's selling a few small things, especially if you're importing them. So he was put in prison for that. And uh, um, when he got out, uh, he was (laughs) started doing it again. So they put him in prison again. Um, And so when he got out the second time, he started publishing uh, 
anti-communist newspapers and having rallies against uh, communists and so forth. And so the Americans gave us political refugee status, and that's how we ended up in the United States. And I was 10 at the time. So that was um, quite a while back. Yeah, well, I mean, it's um, it's interesting. As a 10-year-old, you know, I mean, I remember what it was like whenever I was 10, you know, and, and growing up. And, you know, you, you hear these horror stories about, you know, growing up as a 10 year old and, and wherever. But I can't even imagine what it was like in, in moving, you know, from the Soviet Union. And your dad, you said, went to prison twice in that 10 year uh, time span. Right. And then so right. how did you how did if you can yeah, selling pants. Here, what's that? It's crazy but for selling pants. Yeah. 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 So so how did you escape from the Soviet Union to to get to the United States? I mean, how did that process even kind of happen to be able to get over here to become political refugees? Well, so the, the American government, as far as I understand, not being an expert in this matter, um, finds sponsors for people that are political refugees that maybe are persecuted in some sense by a government. Uh, there is a process where you can apply for political refugee status to come to the United States legally, and a sponsor is found. In our case, it's really almost like a movie in terms of how we came here, because once you're done with the extensive process of health checks and um, all kinds of paperwork, several years worth, and you come here, when we flew in, a church in Minot, North Dakota sponsored us. So we flew in about 10 to midnight into this tiny airport. And it's January 22nd. Um, so you can imagine Minot, North Dakota on January. And there is a group of about 30 people from the church with balloons waiting for us. So it's something like from a movie. And by the time we get to our, they put us into this car and it's like another world. And when you're coming up in the late 80s and Soviet Russia, early 90s, and you're a child it's basically like winning a billion dollars or something it's it's something that if the united states was like um uh, this world that everybody wants to be part of and so you when you come here you're just elated and especially the experience we had and then we have a fully furnished apartment and my parents both had jobs right away not good jobs that everybody wants to have but their jobs nevertheless just mm -hmm. normal jobs and it was a this church, they were just uh, great people, and they really helped us out to, to get get on our feet. And um, so that's kind of the beginning of the story. And, and uh, as as time went, we just grew, and we moved down south to Florida uh, after a couple of years in North Dakota because it was just too small of a town for us. But uh, that's how it started. Wow. So, um, so you say us. Did you have siblings as well as your mom and dad then? Just my parents. I was the only child. Okay, so that so that probably made it a little bit easier for your parents. I can guarantee you, as opposed to having you know multiple kids to have to you know feed or, or whatever the case may be as you came in. So you say regular jobs whenever you first landed in the states for for your parents. Um, but I would imagine you know as you mentioned, you were elated to even be on U.S. soil out of you know from from the beginning. I, I would assume. Oh yes, yeah. so. Back then, it was just people that lived in the Soviet Union were just so tired of the misery that when you come to the United States, there was just such a, a great reputation of what the United States is that when I was here, I remember walking to Longfellow Elementary is the, is the school I went to. It's elementary school. And I just, it was such a great feeling. I still remember it. It's 30, almost 30 years ago. And uh, you just feel so great, like you're, you're, I don't know, like you're not in heaven, but almost there, you know, it's uh, uh, just a great feeling. Um, so, yeah, it was just the fact that being being here um, was just a dream come true, basically, for a, for a young 10 year old at that point. Yeah. So then so then from there, you end up moving to Florida. Good move. <laughs> um, right. uh, obviously, the Sunshine State and, you know. You guys are experiencing a lot more freedom right now in the United States, speaking of that, than, than others are uh, right now, especially in California or New York or whatever. And maybe a bit of a cautionary tale uh, with your background. I'm sure you've, you know, sharing your story with others, you know, that, that the freedom is, is pretty uh, important to be able to, 
you know, maintain. And the last thing you want to do is have any tyrannic, tyrannical uh, states or, you know, special the, the, the federal government, you know, stopping you from being able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. So speaking of that, um, you ended up in Florida then at about what age? And then how from there did you get into the financial services? Well, so I was 12 when I ended up in Florida and I started looking for a job right away. But because of the laws that exist, you can't really work until you're 14 and nobody really wants to hire you until you're 16. So I was able to find a dentist that needed some work done and he became like a mentor. He he had houses that needed to be repaired and um, things around the office just needed to be done. And there I basically worked after school for until I went to college and uh, uh I got exposure to stocks and investing uh, with him because he wanted me to screen for some stocks through Investors Business Daily and a few other publications. And I just knew that I just understood myself and and what I wanted. And I knew that uh, um, I liked thinking about I don't really care about sports, even though I'm athletic. I just didn't really care about watching sports. I don't care for much as hobbies except really geopolitics and, and investments and finance. That's what I care about. So if that's the things I'm interested in, then um, that's probably what I'm going to be good at. And finance, to be good in investing, you have to at least be somewhat well-versed in, in those subjects. So I went to, um, Dr. Woodward was his name, my mentor, and uh, he told me, well, go to University of Florida, you know, because that's where he went. And I said, okay. So I just went there and uh, learned finance. And um, after that, started working for Morgan Stanley was my first, uh, my first uh, official investment firm that I worked with. So, um, so when you went to the University of Florida, so you're a Gator, um, you decided that I'm going to take all the classes that are going to help me, I'm assuming, because you had an attraction to financial services and, and investing and, and things of that nature. So how did, uh, was there any type of influences other than your mentor when you were in college whenever you decided to go out, you know, venture out on your own? I mean, and how much of um, the, did the mentorship from your dentist help you in creating and crafting the, uh, you know, a, a bit of your own, you know, sovereign wealth management? Well, actually, you know, in college, I'm not really a bookish type of person. I like to read books, not the ones that are assigned, but the ones that I, I want to read. So there I had another, you could say mentorship. There was a, an award-winning franchisee. I needed money, so I needed to work. So I uh, went and, and uh, applied for a job at uh, um, Domino's. And I wasn't good at learning those computer systems, but as soon as I saw the guy who owns the franchisee, uh, the who owns all the franchises, there's five of them, I came up there and said, listen, why don't I do the marketing for you or something uh, besides this stuff that you know I'm not good at? And he said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he actually needed somebody by that time. So I kind of learned more business skills, which you have to understand if you want to understand which companies to invest in, you have to understand business at a basic level, I, would, I, I suspect. And um, that's where I had more business sense. And obviously, the, all the books and all the CAPM models and so forth, you learn all that also. Um, but as time went on, you know, the only jobs you can really get are the sales jobs. It's very hard to get the investment uh, analysis oriented types of roles. But I knew that I didn't want to be a regular type of a broker that you start off with at Morgan Stanley. And they, they don't want you really to do any investing. They just want you to really get new clients and put them into programs, which is fine. But I knew eventually I would be able to invest the way I want to invest. And that's a, it was a long way, but I finally got to where I'm at now, where I can actually invest um, in models the way that I create based on the trends and themes that I see happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, so when you were at Morgan Stanley, obviously you learned, you know, the, some skills, you learned some, some things, maybe you learned things of what you didn't want to do uh, more than anything is what it sounds right. like. But how long were you at Morgan Stanley originally then? For two years. So there was a program that um, for, for trainees, basically for trainees um, to start um, building up clientele and so forth. And then from there, 
there was a big center, national center at uh, Merrill Lynch there as well. So um, when I was done at Morgan Stanley after two years, I went to Merrill Lynch because it was a certain group where you work with clients that are already at the firm. And um, I was 23 at the time. So it, I didn't have great success at that time convincing a lot of people to be my clients. Um, I had a few clients, but not enough to really support um, myself. Um, so I came on board with uh, Merrill Lynch, where there was already a base of clients that I could work with, and I could actually spend more time in terms of actually doing investing instead of just trying to get new clients all the time and build up a practice. Gotcha. And then so... When did you decide to break away and decide, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to um, create my own firm and I'm going to build this out on my own and become, I guess, completely fully independent. Did that happen fairly soon after that then? So 2014 or so. So I, from, I spent four years at Merrill and then I had a um, offer from uh, Schwab, Charles Schwab to come on board as a, to interview um, as a portfolio consultant where um, I was managing a few hundred million dollars in terms of uh, investments for clients and actually consulting them on their investments and in Orlando, Florida. And that fit me even better than Merrill. And so I came on board with them, but there I realized also, again, there's you know, a bunch of levels of bureaucracy above me. I really understood by that point that I can't be a corporate person. I needed to have my own, uh, my own uh, project. So so the bottom line was, is that you, you wanted to invest in certain ways and they wouldn't let you. Well, right. It's that some of that is, is that and I was managing 300 million at that point and I didn't really want to move up the corporate ladder. I liked the investment business, but I naturally want to do things my way and, you know, making the amount of money I would make, uh, managing 300 million or even a smaller fraction than that, uh, of that, um, with my own firm, obviously, if I could build up a book uh, or buy out a book of business would be just exponentially higher um, than than what I'm making at in a corporate position. You get the comfort. I mean, there's nothing wrong with corporate jobs. There's people that are great at that, but you get the comfort, but you really are never going to be independently wealthy uh, unless you give them your soul. And when I say that, the corporation will take your soul if, if you want, if you want um if you want to be wealthy based on what you do there, because how much was a guy in a corporate position like that making per year for managing 300 million? At that point, it was 110, 120. That was in, you know, yeah, 20, that's what I was guessing. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's very standard. They all know all these big firms. They know exactly what each other, what that position makes at all the firms. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could, the top performers were really making maybe closer to 130, 140, sometimes 150, sometimes, but it depends on a lot of factors. And so I just, it wasn't really motivating for me. So um, I started looking for something else, um, something more of my own. And I, I was hired by a CPA firm to build out their wealth management unit in Ocala, Florida, did that for a, for a year, kind of butted heads with the management there. Um, and then I really started looking, I, I really need to do my own thing. So I, found out, uh, found, started calling all of the coast, basically, uh, looking for a practice to buy out. And I found um, a great lady. Uh, she was one of the first CFPs in the DC area in the 80s, before it was cool, uh, Linda English. And um, she, um, her husband had had a stroke and uh, she needed help. Um, and most of her practice was actually already sold off, but basically there were kind of the crumbs left, so to speak. And I came in and helped her organize all of that and um, um, build that up. And then eventually we had a five-year partnership buyout, but we did accelerated it after a year and a half. I just fully bought her out and just continue as, as the sole principal, so to speak, of this venture, Sovereign Wolf Management. And I rebranded well, it. That's awesome. That's my own. So the That's sovereign awesome. wealth management is kind of what I like because I'm in. I believe in individual sovereignty. I'm actually an anarcho-capitalist by, uh, you know, by uh, my own philosophy, so to speak. And uh, certainly, when I look at what's happening in America, um, unfortunately, Russia 
<laughs> I, I know people actually going back there because they see Russia being the anti-communist that the United States was in the 1950s at this point. And unfortunately, uh, maybe the United States and the West is moving much more towards that that um, type of a setup. And the people that live communism, they understand, they can sense it miles away versus maybe people that haven't and are naive about it because they haven't lived in it. It sounds good. Uh, they, they can't see where things are going. So Yeah. That's Gary. That's really awesome. I, your story is really cool. Um, it, it just seems like you know that independence and freedom, and you know that do-it-yourself mentality has just been you know exuding out of you since you were a little kid, and you've always worked, right? You didn't set back, and you were always out there hustling and getting things done and looking and scraping, and then now you've found yourself to where it sounds like you want to be, right? Yes, uh, I greatly enjoy. Um, and then this is my little, I haven't missed a day at the office since COVID or anything. So I greatly enjoy being here uh, with my six, six screens. And um, just uh, the hard part is really understanding that you need to even maybe it'll become less enjoyable, but you have to grow and you have to force yourself to make it a bigger business, even if it's not going to be as enjoyable as just being having a lifestyle practice. And this has never been a lifestyle practice for me. It's always been a really a professional type of a project. So awesome. Okay, guys, well, we're going to take a break and we get back. Uh, we will get more into the story and life of Gary Korolev. Is it Korolev? Korolev, yeah. Yeah. Gary Korolev. We'll be right back. Estate planning. What does that even mean? When the inevitable happens for everyone on this planet, your estate plan kicks into action. But first, let's start with what an estate is. An estate is simply everything you own. Now, here's the issue and what needs to be understood when this event occurs. You only have two choices on this plan. Number one, either you plan how your estate gets handed out and distributed to those you leave behind. Or number two, your state decides who gets everything you own. For the first time ever, you can now take complete and total control of this plan that you've been deprived of for most of your life and generations before you. You can get personalized assistance along the way with a team of specialists whose job it is to make sure you have true peace of mind. It's important to understand that estate planning is a journey and rest assured that our team will be available to you all along the way and at every step. Welcome to eState Plan, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. To learn more, make sure to reach out to your local advisor licensed with us or go to our website for more information. Welcome back, in Richards. Tim James here with my co-host Carter Wilcox, and today in the house we've got Gary Korolev. And uh, Gary, your your backstory is awesome, dude. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I love hearing stories like that, you know. And everybody has their own story, their own journey, and it's really good to to see somebody who you know what came out of oppression. And sounds like a lot had to do with your dad, you know, um, and your mom. They were probably is your mom and dad still alive? Yes, they're here in the U.S. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. I'd love to, I'd love to, actually, I, I would love to chat, chat with your dad. That would be really cool. Um, and meet, meet him. That would be really cool. And your mom too. So, um, well, moving forward now, here you are, you've, you've got your own financial, you got your own wealth management company. And why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided to start your own, uh, uh, RIA. Well, so right now I'm being affiliated with another um, broker dealer RIA, you know, it's really not, you know, they're as good as it gets. They're as good as it gets. Spire is as good as it gets when it comes to being affiliated with somebody because um, while being perfectly compliant with all the rules, they give me all the leeway I need because the bigger these people get, you know, they're basically become more of your enemy that slows you down than somebody that's working with you because, you know, um, it just the stakes are that much higher for for a RIABD to protect themselves versus let you explore things. So, but in the end, I realized that if I'm going to have Russian language clients and if I'm going to have a, my own native, let's say, crypto strategy, on um, 
pure crypto custodian, in addition to my standard wealth management clients. You know, that those are things that I want to do. I can't, won't be able to do them even with a, a platform as, as liberal as Spire is, liberal in a good sense of uh, traditional liberal 18th century. Um, Classic liberal, good, oh, the right. good ones, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so that's why I had to, I realized I had to make this move because if you don't, compliance wise, anything in Russian, unless a compliance officer can speak the language, you have to translate everything. Well, I'm not going to be doing that. Um, so I, there's are several lines that I'm that I'm getting into besides just standard uh, wealth management, plain vanilla that that people are used to. So, so, um, so Gary, then you know, let's talk a little bit about you know your clientele and who you're trying to attract. And it sounds like you know it's it's a bit of a niche. Obviously, you have very good control of the Russian language, is what it sounds like. And then I, I'm curious. How did you, you know, how do you find, and, and I mean, I've got no idea, right? Because this is the first time anybody that's been on the podcast. By the way, Tim, how cool did we find a guest that could talk about what it was like in Soviet, you know, Union uh, at, at the time to be able to share some of that, and, and especially with what's going on, you know, right now. But uh, that's why I was excited about having Gary on the show. But just out of curiosity, like, like how do you find your, you know, your, your Russian speaking clients? Well, that's mostly through networking and I have a marketing. Um, so I have a, a journalist that actually used to um, um, ask me questions and uh, ask my opinion on, on financial matters. And she worked for a big Russian um, news agency. And now she stopped that and actually she works, she does marketing for me. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, we're basically building out a, a whole another website and so forth when that can launch whenever the RIA is approved um, to go specifically after that market. Um, so it's really built on trust because there's a segment of the population in Russia that let's say is fairly wealthy or very wealthy, but they really don't know who to trust. They want to have at least part of their money outside um, of, of the country, just in a different jurisdiction, whether it is because they want to immigrate to the United States or whether they just want to have it offshore. And, you know, you want to make sure you can do that legally and uh, instill trust when you do that um, for investors. And so that's a niche that is uh, potentially a, a, um, a very um, high growth area because a lot of firms in the United States, they clam up very quickly when you speak about Eastern Europe because they think automatically it's all corrupt or a lot Russian of mafia. <laughs> right, right. And that's more 90s, early 2000s. There's a lot of legitimate wealth there, too, um, at this point. And so um, you just want to make sure that we get out there and uh, make ourselves known and um, potentially you know, are able to find those clients. Yeah. So, um now, the new website that you're going to launch once you get your RIA um, uh, approved and everything, will you will it be a Russian based or will you have like two like translated, you know, websites, one for English speaking, one for Russian speaking? Or how will that work? Well, we would have uh, two websites. It's just one Russian and it, they're slightly they're actually for very different clientele, right? Our sovereign wealth management website, that's more of a US wealth management client focused. And that's a very different client than a Russian high net worth investor who's looking to park their money uh, with an investment professional somewhere abroad, uh, offshore. Um, or onshore in the United States. So sure. Yeah, offshore for them because they're obviously in Russia, right? Right. And offshore, they could want it to be offshore Russia and offshore U.S. as well, just managed by a trustworthy source in the U.S. regulated jurisdiction. So it could be offshore through a, a very solid custodian. Um, mm -hmm. Any of the, the custodians can do offshore, but with an advisor who's regulated in the United States, so they feel safer with, with that. So I'm not controlled by any regulators in Eastern Europe. I'm controlled. So let's say I'm regulated by the United States entity, um, you know, the SEC or the Virginia State Corporation Commission, for, for example. So that's that's important. 
Gotcha. So, um, so do you still have some uh, some connections to in your current clientele that are in Florida, or are all your clients pretty much in in Virginia then? A lot in Virginia, some abroad also, just a little bit in South America, and um, and just through kind of osmosis referrals, and um, a lot in Maryland and some in Florida across the U.S. really, um, just as people move around and people get referred, you just gather clients from all over the place. So it's really a national or a global setup these days, especially post-COVID. People like Zoom a lot of times more than even coming in. So, Yeah, so, so then let's talk a little bit about that. How has the trajectory and the potential growth and the niche that you're going to be going towards um, how do you think that's actually benefited you as you're going to start your own RIA, seeing as people have become a lot more comfortable on these Zoom type meetings? Well, so if we're getting the word out about us, whether it's through advertising or connections that we have, um, let's say in the United States, or if we're talking about, um, let's say, in the Russian speaking population, you know, the fact that you can emphasize the fact that we can either meet in person or we can do a zoom call um that's a lot of people are not used to that they, they don't really imagine that if you call merrill lynch for some for some reason or one of the big firms that you're going to be able to do a zoom call with an advisor uh, i think that's just people think of phone calls so just having that zoom option or the fact that i can you know go out and get a plane ticket and fly to wherever i need to go if it's a big enough potential opportunity that that makes people uh feel good about what's what we can do and it's important to emphasize a few little um advantages of working with somebody who's not at a very big firm again so for instance i per regulations you know i can't mention specific investments we've made but you know a few investments we've made over the last let's say a year ago you know they've done so well and just now a lot of these big firms are starting to be able to make those types of investments just because they're just starting to cover them. Well, we've already been in those investments. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm not saying we all always do well in everything. Sometimes we make, uh, as, as everybody, you know, make investment decisions that don't work out, but that that's an advantage that we have to emphasize being smaller and more nimble and being able to take those risks that a bigger firm would just would not want to take those risks. So. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, so it, it, it's fair to say that having a comprehensive team that surrounds you, and, and I've been on your website, looks very comprehensive, but that agileness, that, that ability to be nimble, as you called it, that is, as far as you're concerned, a much more advantageous reason of why your prospective clients should or want to work with you. Is that, is that, is that a fair assessment? Yes, the fact that they know who they're dealing with, the fact that while the money is well protected and at a distance from us, so we're not they're not putting money into Gary Korolev's account or Sovereign Wealth Management's account, the money is in a segregated account at a well-regulated giant custodian, but at the same time, they have access to the very person who founded the company and runs the company. That's a lot of credibility versus just working with an advisor at another firm that may have just been hired and there's more of a sales client facing sales role. It's a very different approach, but not everybody understands that. I think um, um, some people understand it. Some don't. So. Gotcha. So, Curry, so you, know, I, you, get, you guys, I wanted to point something out for, for those listening that are, are not an advisor, you know, a lot of times people think there's more safety in the bigger companies, right? The Morgan Stanley's, the Merrill Lynch's and the Charles Schwab's. So why is a guy like Gary going through all that wanting to move away from it, right? Because he wants more control. He wants to be able to control and not be handcuffed. So what people don't understand is like, maybe you, the market tanks, right? And you lose your money at Morgan Stanley. So you're like, I'm getting a new, I'm going somewhere else. I'm getting a new advisor, right? So then you go to Merrill Lynch or you go to Charles Schwab or you know, whoever, uh, Meriprise. And basically all you're getting is you're going to take the same deck of cards, reshuffle it, and they're going to give it back to you. These companies are all doing the same stuff, right? There is no out of the side of the box thinking. They're very slow. They're very big moving. Um, 
and then you're you're right back and they're like oh well yeah i did a terrible morgan stanley did a terrible job for me but merrill lynch was really good but if you looked at the timeline when they got in with merrill lynch um and when they got in and out with uh or excuse me morgan stanley merrill lynch it was just like basically following the s p 500 right it was the same oh, stuff yeah. there was no and especially with mutual funds, you know, I've talked about this before. It's like drives me nuts. When I was a financial advisor, it's like these mutual fund managers are literally handcuffed by prospectus. They can't change the investments, even if they see a big storm coming and they know it's going to tank. They can't do anything. And by working with a smaller firm that's has six screens and he's plugged in 24 seven and there's a team there um, watching things they're they are more nimble and they can actually give you more diversification and more options that you could from a big firm because they just don't have them. If you go to a baker, they bake, you go to a surgeon, they cut. If you go to um, Charles Schwab, you're going to walk out of their stock sponsor mutual funds. That's it. All right. Thank you for that insight. And that's exactly how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's pretty cool. So, so one last question, I know we're coming up on, uh, on another, on another break, but, um, how has the challenge and obviously it you know it doesn't happen if everybody was if it was easy everybody would be doing it right how is the challenge of starting your own ria what have you learned along the way and that makes you even though it's been challenging you know it's going to be worth it but what's been maybe the biggest challenge that you've had in trying to get your firm off the ground your own ria well first thing to know is you always need to hire a consultant that does this type of work and that's what i've done um and uh, so Greenwich, they're part of uh, they're part of uh, Interactive Brokers because that's one of the custodians that I plan to use. Um, you have to hire consultants to do this. It's not worth to doing it on your own to save a few thousand dollars. That's one. But uh, regulators, as good a people as they can be, you know, it's still a bureaucracy. And if you're coming up with anything new, like for instance, we are attempting to have as part of our lines of business a crypto a managed strategy that's pure crypto on the Gemini platform as a custodian and at actually crypto digital assets. And because it's something that's so new, they get very, you could say, careful about that sort of thing. And, and uh, so there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of emailing, a lot of additional information being asked for and what a, a process that should have been um, already completed is, is taking this long because it's something new. So if you plan to bring something on that's out of the ordinary, you expect more scrutiny, which makes sense uh, in, a, in a way. It's not unreasonable, you could say, for them to be extra worried about, extra careful about something this new that potentially could lose investors' money if it's not done right. Sure, sure. So um, from from the beginning then, last question, then we'll, then we'll go to break. But um, from the beginning of when you decided, OK, I'm going to start my own RIA and it's going to be more, you know, crypto based and everything. How long has that been that entire process been taking then? And how long do you think how much longer until you think that you're fully authorized to do your thing? Well, if they keep coming back every we get an email every um Sometimes we thought we would be approved like three months ago. So at times we'll come, we'll get an email saying, okay, well, just give us this one more piece of information and it'll be good to go. We'll, we'll get you approved. And then we come back with that piece of information and then they find something new to ask. Maybe because an attorney came up with something on their side, you know, um, or for whatever reason, maybe somebody read something else somewhere on a, in terms of um, our ADB and, uh, then they come back and it takes a few more weeks. So literally it could be any day, but we have stopped saying that months ago. So we <laughs> have been a holding pattern until um, hopefully we get approval and uh, you know, things, things go our way and we can transition our clients. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, look, Gary, I really appreciate you sharing not only your, your story and everything uh, previously, but, you know, updating us. And maybe by the time we launch this podcast, maybe, you know, it'll be right whenever you're approved for your own RIA. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, dude. I was uh, actually in the process of doing that myself. And then I and then I switched over and started doing the health stuff. So, um I guess that'd be a good time to segue. So we're going to take another quick break. And then when we get back, we're going to flip the script and let Gary ask me any question he has about health. We'll be right back.
want the absolute best for yourself, and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently. We're proud it's chemical-free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here with my co-host Carter Wilcoxon. Again, in the house, we've got Gary Korolev with um, Sovereign Wealth Management. On his way, maybe by the time you're listening, he might be a registered investment advisory uh, practice. He's He's got the app in, but, or the application, but they just keep sending him one more thing to do. So, <laughs> all right, Gary, this is the point where we um, flip the script and you get to ask me anything on health. So, have at it. What, what's your question, brother? Okay, so... Um, always trying to lose those last few pounds around the, the waist to have that six pack. And um, so I'm a big fan of the ketogenic diet. Um, but what do you think about, but sugar is my, is my uh, enemy, so to speak. It's, it's my addiction that I'm always trying to fight. So mm. what do you think about a ketogenic diet versus uh, some of the others out there in terms of uh, weight loss and counting calories too and so forth? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, you know, um, you know, the way I look at it is I take a 30,000 point view because I've been through this stuff so long and it's like in nature, let's think about this. You ever, you ever seen a deer look over to an elk and say, Hey, where do you get your protein or you doing keto or you doing paleo? You know what I mean? It's just, it, it doesn't happen. Every single creature in, in nature, except for man and the domesticated animals that we've deal with, you know, that are pets and our zoo animals, it's pretty freaking healthy. Um, they're evolving pretty much except for, you know, all the pollution that man has created and, um, they just kind of got to figure it out. They know what their diet is. That's what blows my mind. It's like, really here it is 2021 and we're, and we have supposedly the smartest, I mean, we're cloning sheep, but we don't even know what to eat. Is it really that big of a myth? Is it really that hard to figure out how to lose those last few pounds or is it really that hard to understand how to boost the immune system? It's not. It's because there's people that are in elite positions that are against the working class and they want to beat us down all the time. So, you know, that's the bigger picture. So when it comes to you wanting to lose those last few pounds, I can't even imagine you have any. You look pretty darn fit for me for on through the screen here, which is awesome because a lot of times the financial advisors we deal with are not, you know, they're overweight and they're tired and they're stressed out. So obviously um, you enjoy working out. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, an hour a day on the weekdays and then some jujitsu also when I could get it in with my son, we go to a, a gym here, but uh, oh, you know, nice. it's really not nice. where I'm hugely overweight. It's to really like, I think if I could lose like five pounds, I would be perfect where I want to be, but it's, it's always that stubborn okay. last few pounds that you can't, can't shake you know okay so here's here's a couple hacks that just work really well um when when do you have your last meal of the day um so i only eat once a day actually because i i eat in the evening um i eat around seven and okay well if you're if you were gonna if you're eating two or three meals a day we, we would if you're on two meals a day we, for those listening we would say you know three meals a day we'd say get down to two avoid breakfast and replace that with liquid nourishment to continue that that fast that's a really powerful component of the keto lifestyle diet you know the keto camp um and getting people off of um, sugar which is what they, they talk about a lot but um you know if you were eating two or three meals a day we would say not eating the last meal until after 6 p.m but you're doing all day long eating at seven o'clock that's fine so the next thing is is we have to look deeper and um have you been tested for candida no, um, I don't even know what that is. Is that a bacteria? So Candida albicans is a yeast, and it, it can get overgrown in people. And um, it, I'll save you like $300. And if people listening, you can do this too. So for the next six days, what you'll do is you'll wake up in the morning. You'll take a glass of water, just regular tap water. And then before you brush your teeth, before you drink any water, do anything. Don't do anything with your mouth. 
work up about a quarter to dime size spit and spit in that glass, set it down, go about your business for about 30 minutes, come back and then look at it. If that thing, and you're going to do this every single day for six days, okay? When you look at that spit, if it grows legs downwards or sinks to the bottom, then you have candida albicans. You have a yeast overgrowth in your body. And these things will actually hijack your uh, vagus nerve up to your brain, and they will steer you to eat muffins and sugary shit because they want that. They thrive on sugar because it's acid-based, right? They literally take over our emotions in our brain, right? So to knock those things out, first you have to do that. So do the test, see if you have it. Now, if the spit floats on top every day in a row for six days, you probably don't have it. It's a high, 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 high probability. And I just saved you like 300 bucks. But any one of those for six days, if the legs grow down on that spitter, it sinks to the bottom. You have candida albicans. It's a yeast overgrowth. And then if you have that, then there's different ways, you know, there's uh, formulas you can take, certain types of supplements you can take to knock it out, um, obviously reducing the sugar intake. Another thing you can do is start replacing um, sugar with other things like stevia or monk fruit. You can look into these two things. Stevia is 100 times sweeter than sugar in its liquid form, but you just have to make sure they don't process it with chemicals. There's a brand called Stevita, S-T-E-V-I-T-A, Stevita brand stevia. And their liquid drops are processed without chemicals. That's a good one. If you're going to do the powdered version of stevia, make sure it's not white because that means it was also processed with chemicals. Stevia in nature is a green leaf. And that green leaf, if they dehydrate it under 110, 115 degrees, keep the enzymes active and gently grind it into a, a powder, a green powder, now you've got uh, something that's about 40 times sweeter than sugar. You can put in your coffee or, you know, make, you know, pastries or whatever you're doing you're cooking that type of stuff so green stevia powder or stevita brand stevia um those are the two good ones that i know of and then monk fruits 170 times sweeter than sweeter than sugar it's really good because it actually helps to regulate blood sugar so it'd be also good for people that are diabetic um cinnamon is also a good spice that has um some some great benefits to it and it also helps to kind of sweeten things um and um uh, you know, other than that, I would say probably, when do you have your, these sweet cravings? When are they coming on? Well, it's just after dinner. So, and I think the big problem is I, since I eat once a day, I eat a lot in the evening and also I eat too late and then it's too close to bedtime. So mm -hmm. it all kind of goes to overnight uh, type of, uh, calories and, uh, I stay at work too late. So, um, you know, I'm just, it's just in the evening too late, um, so, okay. that's the so this is really important. Remember I told you early, we, we, if you can, if you could have your last meal at six o'clock instead of seven, that's going to help because the reason why is it's not just about, uh, you know, th there's this thing called circadian rhythms. Are you familiar with them? Right. During when you sleep or when. Yeah. Wake cycles sleep. and stuff. So if you look at our skin tone, you know, in our skin, we're supposed to be within about 1500 miles of the equator. If it wasn't for, you know, heavy coats and, and heating units and stuff like that, and air conditioning, we wouldn't be living all of these other places, right? So we would be living in more of a, you know, a temp, more of a humid, you know, warmer climate. Look at our skin. Okay, in nature, the polar bear wouldn't be in Florida. That's why he's up there because he's got a big heavy coat, right? So we have to get back to where would we normally be in nature, right? So the circadian rhythms of life are like this. When the sun comes up without Thomas Edison and candles, we'd wake up. And when the sun goes down, we would go to bed. So the closer you can get your sleep patterns to that, the healthier you're going to be because, especially when the weight loss thing, the stubborn weight loss thing, people are going to bed and they might be getting eight hours sleep, but they wake up and they're tired or they're, or they're having issues losing weight. And this is what's called shallow sleep syndrome. And it's actually disrupting your metabolic processes and stuff and hormones inside of your body. It will make it almost impossible to for people to lose to lose that last bit of weight or even lose weight in general at all that's why what we believe to do is like whatever let's say what time is your bedtime i usually like 10 30 something like that okay 11. so 10 30 so what we would have you do is instead of reminder on your phone at 9 30 that reminds you it's time to prepare for bed time to prepare for bed that means blue lights off everything's off you you start you dim the lights because those you know those lights when you have lights on like we have right now um your brain is processing saying oh it's light out produce serotonin right be awake it's not going to produce the melatonin it's going to help you slip into those cycles we have to get you into those deep 
restive restorative cycles of, of regeneration. So prepare for bed, dim the lights, crack the windows at night, making sure you're having fresh air um, or have air purification systems in your house. Very important. We take you know 20,000 breaths a day and people are overlooking this air component. It is a major input to our physical system. Our body, it's the most important nutrient. I mean, without it, we'd be dead in four to seven minutes, right? So oxygen, the breath that we take, is probably the first thing that we should look at for ourselves and our family if we want to promote our health because it's going in and out of us every single day, 20,000 times. And then after that, you know, you want to get your water right. We mentioned this off, off camera here a little bit ago. Uh, make sure your water is purified and, and restructured, especially if you're on city tap water. So um, those are some things you can look at. You can also look at um, getting what's called a grounding pad or grounding mat or grounding sh sheets. Um, you can buy this from a company called earthing.com. You might want to write that down, earthing.com. And then what happens is, is that the earth puts off a natural frequency. Um, that's why, you know, you hold up a compass anywhere in the world and it moves, right? There's a frequency coming off the earth. And when we are in, our bare skin is in contact with it, we are grounded. And that is literally charging us on a cellular level. And as soon as our bare skin breaks with the earth, we are now creating inflammation, disrupting sleep cycles, these types of things. So what outside of every commercial in, in, in your home, in residential building, there's an iron rod driven down into the dirt and there's a cord on it. It goes into the electrical grid. It's the third prong. It's the foundation. It's the ground. And these mats, um, you can plug them into them and these sheets have silver threads in them. You can plug it in just to the third prong and you can lay them on your, they'll be touching your skin. And at night you're getting grounded while you're sleeping, charging your cells, and, and balancing these normal rhythms and the frequency of your body. It's pretty, pretty awesome. And that helps people. So, you know, another thing I would say is also get really into some teas. Maybe there's some teas that you would like. Just make sure that if you're going to bed at 1030, you wouldn't want to have any tea probably after 930. And then the last thing is right before you go to sleep, take a leak, go pee, even if you don't think you have to, because that that can wake you up and disrupt your sleep which will disrupt that final piece of weight loss mm, that's very interesting um yeah that's quite a few quite a few ideas um thank you yeah. uh, and you can do one two three four stack them together and just or start stacking them until you get yeah. the results you want right keep the ones you like discard as far the ones as stevia like. do you know any stevias that actually taste like sugar because they all have in my in my view from what i've seen they all have an aftertaste that's not like sugar, you know. They're... Yeah, it's 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 a little bit different. And a lot of that's because of the chemical processing. If you get the ones I'm talking about, they're not like that. Okay, 25% of people do not like stevia at all. The aftertaste drives them nuts, okay. My ex-wife was like that. She hated it. But when we found Stevita brand stevia, if she did the right amount, like let's say we made a chai tea latte, Maybe I'm, I'm a freaking sweet face. You know, I just sweet tooth or whatever you want to call it. And I put 20 drops in that sucker where for her it might be five and she's good. But if she goes to six or seven or nine or ten, then that, that after tasty thing is there for her. But with this brand, if you use smaller amounts, you're able to sweeten it without it and it actually tastes, tastes like sugar. I see. And the monk fruit, I've actually tried that, but there's always other ingredients in there. Like even if the more expensive. Yeah, it, we, nobody's like, done it yet. We, my formula and I have been talking about it. We're going to, we'll probably create our own version of that soon with the packets and stuff. And I want to do electrolytes too, like a real good version because you, you're right. They always have like erythrol in it or something else that you, that, you know, that you don't want. So, but um, monk fruit's pretty awesome. We actually use it to um sweeten and flavor certain things like our turmeric 100 liquid drops these anti-inflammatory drops that we have and also our green 85 juice formula which is our uh we have this super concentrated green juice we made um that replaces the 85 percent of nutrients farmed out of the soil and that one is pretty awesome because you know because it replaces like three to five pounds of vegetables in a scoop and people can drink it really quick and get it down but the monk fruit and red raspberry extract is what we use to kind of mask the flavor. And it was tough, man. I'm telling you, because when you take greens and concentrate them the way we did and try to make it not taste like pond scum, it was tough. <laughs> but, but I think we cracked the code on it. We, 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 it 
kind of just tastes like a, I don't know, kind of like a tea. I mean, a lot of people uh, comment on how, how they can't believe how good it tastes. So monk fruit was definitely part of the recipe in that deal. So look into monk fruit too. Try to find something that you can, you can use. Interesting. Thank you, Tim. It's great. You're welcome, man. Yeah. All, all, all great, great questions, question. and everything. And I know that we could probably, you know, go on and on and on about um, all kinds of different things, but you know, Gary, it was for me, it was awesome to partner up with Tim because he is just such a wealth of this of these, you know, health questions. And if you listen to any of the other podcasts that are on there, you know, we talk a lot about a whole bunch of other things that uh, I think could probably help you out as well. But, you know, for me, the number one thing that uh, that Tim has just pounded into me from day one is about restructuring your water. And I know we talked Oh, in this show about how much we talk about water and everything and, and, you know, being hydrated with the right kind of water and restructured, that's a, that's a pretty key component as well. Yeah. If we keep going at this rate, Carter's learning so darn fast. I'll probably, we'll, we'll flip the script. I'll be doing the well stuff. And he'll start the stuff. <laughs> restructuring water. I've never heard that term before. Yeah. So simply like when you, when, when, if you're on city tap water, the city tap, the pipes are very high pressure and that, coagulates the water molecules and makes them too big so you can drink it but it'll just go through you pee it out you don't get good absorption so instead of being like four or five in a cluster it's like 20 to 25 in a cluster right it's like a bowling ball trying to go through a chain link fence so by restructuring the water and there's you know the the cheapest way to do it i guess would be take your glass and just stir it with a spoon right Cl mm -hmm. stir it as fast as you can and there's forks that swirl around but there's machines that actually do a really good job at this like i have this machine I purify my water, I triple purify it, then I run it through this machine that restructures it, alkalizes it, and then actually charges it with molecular hydrogen. You would love it because what you do is you just drink a quart of that water in the morning. Um, I actually do three quarts of that. I do one in the morning, then I drink another one with my scoop of greens in it, and I do another one right after that, about 15 minutes apart. And I'm freaking high on water for six hours. <laughs> like, the energy is ridiculous. It's like you're literally... Everything that we do over here, we're trying to actually charge your cells with electrons. We're trying to increase your cells vibrational frequency. And when we do that and it's vibrating at higher frequency, then when free radicals come to attack the cell that, you know, if you're at 75 Hertz and your free radicals are at 60, they bounce off because you're, you're high vibing, right? So not only are you going to have better mental clarity, more energy to make the calls, run your business, deal with stress, stress just seems to go away. Um, you're going to, you're going to fight off disease. You're going to have a higher uh, quality of life, a better immune system, and you're not going to be so susceptible to all this crap that everybody's worrying about. And by worrying about things, I will say to the people out there, if you're listening to the news and getting fear, fear bombarded all the time, that lowers your immune system. Okay. Just by being in fear and being scared is lowering your immune system. You're doing the exact opposite of what you want. Don't get into fear mode. If you're not healthy, you're overweight you, and you, and you're on medications and that type of stuff. Just use it as a wake-up call and get busy and take action and learn about your physical body. Learn that it's a system. Change your inputs, and you can change the quality of your life. Boom. Interesting. I've never heard of that uh, a water system like that. That's uh, what's is that uh, something you've built or is it uh, out there? No, it's it's a company that's been around a long time. It's actually in about almost all the hospitals in Japan too, because they, they can switch the, there's a switch they can flip and I can do it. I do it all the time. That's the water I use to clean my sauna. You can create 2.5 acidic water. It'll kill E. coli, salmonella, everything. It's a hundred percent kill zone, but it's natural and there's no chemicals. It's just water. You can, you can literally clean a hospital with this 2.5 acid water and it wipes out everything. So I take the 2.5 acid water, I make it from my machine. And then I, um, I put a couple drops of like uh, an essential oil blend in there with has like clove and eucalyptus and lemon and that kind of stuff. And that's like a super cleaner for my house. I have non-toxic chemicals. The 11.5 water that comes out of the other end, because remember on the pH scale, we've got zero, which is pure acid to 14, which is pure alkaline. Seven's neutral in the middle. When you take 2.5, then you've basically got, um, you know, what is it? 12, 11.5? 13 point, uh, 12.5, uh, 12.5 coming out, um, coming out the, you know, 11.5 coming out the other end. Yeah. 11.5. So the 11.5 water is very, very alkaline. That water can be used to, you can soak vegetables in it that you're going to eat. You'd be surprised. You get these triple washed vegetables. You think there's no pesticides in them. You put it in 11.5 water and it just sucks the toxins right out of them. 
it's crazy. You can just see the shit coming out in the sink. Or you can use the 11.5 water as kind of like a, um, a bleach type deal uh, when you're doing laundry. So that machine does a lot more. But for me, I just drink the 9.5 water. It's restructured. That's the most important thing for me because then I can drink it and it disappears into my system, right? It goes into my cardiovascular system. It goes into my lymphatic system. It gets into my brain. And, and then later it comes out and then whoosh, it comes out later. So it's actually being used rather than just, you know, if it's not restructured, going in and going out, going in and going out. So that's, that's mostly for folks that are in city tap water, though. If you're on well water, you're probably okay. Very interesting. Yeah, we're on city tap water. I mean, I have a filter, but it's basically the fridge filter that's just clean. Yeah, that's like putting a sock in a river and saying you're purifying the river. It's not, it's the filters are not purifiers. You want purification, right? So there's like reverse osmosis, deionization, distillation. Those are three methods of purification. But every time you go through that process once, you're only going to get about 90% of the contaminants out. That's why you got to do it three times. Because then the second time, you got 10% contaminants left. You run it through the process there. Then you're down to 1%. You run it through again, then you're at 0.1. That's how you get 99.9% .9 purified water. Then you restructure it. And then, you know, the other stuff is just uh, the molecular hydrogen is like the super bad, badass bonus that I didn't even realize. But um with the, with the so that's i've been on i've used i've spent money on six systems but now i have my triple purifier and the and the restructure that charges with the molecular hydrogen that's the system i use and if you want information on it, you can uh, the gal that i bought it from is at mypurifiedwater.com you can book a free consult with her, her name's danusha uh which is like polish and Don, donna for in poland uh but mypurifiedwater.com interesting okay yeah so yeah. um Hey, uh, so guys, here's the deal. I'm, I'm here in Atlanta, as I said, in the, on the top of the call. We're getting ready to go do, I've got an event tonight and everything. We could go on and on right, right, for a while, but I want to I want to be obviously uh, uh, aware of the, the of our enrichers that are listening to us and everything. And, um, you know, Tim is Carter's a- Carter's got to go. Carter's got to go. I, I, re I really do. I got to go. I got, I got my- We're over time anyway. Gary, <laughs> thanks for coming on, brother. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Carter. Thank you, Tim. It was very, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, very pleasant speaking with you both. And I look forward to hopefully um, keep in touch. All yeah, right. no, absolutely. So for my uh, fantastic co-host, Mr. Tim James, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself, our guest today, Gary Korolev, CFA, Sovereign Wealth Management. Uh, thank you so much for being a guest on here today. And uh, for, for you and Richards out there, if you want to hear any of our previous podcasts, you can go to our website at www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com or wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, or Google. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, I am Carter Wilcoxon, CEO and co-founder of Epic Services Company. Thank you again for joining us for another fantastic show of the Health and Wealth Podcast. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. And everybody out there listening, make sure you have a wonderful and abundant rest of your day and week. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Enrichers. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James. And by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies. So tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim.